thing that should have started in March 2020, not March 2023. So none of this inspires confidence that the way we're doing things is, is going to help. In parallel to that, what does give me hope is the confluence of a number of parallel trends that are the basis for renewal and reform. Clearly, these, these involve students' own expressed desires for greater engagement in relevant learning. Kids are learning all the time, um, and they're learning more than they ever were before. They're just not learning it in school. Um, we see advances in personalization and scale that's afforded by technology. That's a huge advantage. And again, as Kathy has reminded us, the scientific progress in understanding uh, in understanding um, learning. All of these are expressed in lots of different spaces in the field right now. They're between what we know about in the science of learning, 40 years of really trying to understand how do human brains learn and ask an incredible question. What would happen if we taught in the way that human brains learn? I know it's almost shocking. So a team of visionary people like uh, all of you on the screen today from our community, from our administration, our teaching staff, our students, uh, families, cultural, philanthropic organizations came together to consider a really bold idea. What might happen if we created a system that was built on students' potential strengths and interests? And what could that look like? So we put assumptions aside and began a design thinking journey. We listened with empathy to find patterns in what our community was saying about their own hopes and dreams and what brought them joy. And what we discovered was that those broad transferable skills that are supported by research in the learning sciences, what we call the six C's, and you'll read about them throughout the, the whole book, uh, that described the joyful strengths-based system that we were looking for. Importantly, in our soul, we get to give the crowded streets back to the people who live and work here. What Rouge was to Ford in the industrial age, Corktown will be for Ford in the information age. A revolution in the artificial intelligence and big data that's gonna be even more disruptive than that industrial age was. The station has good bones. It's in the kind of neighborhood that we know attracts and retains highly skilled and innovative dreamers, makers, creators, entrepreneurs. You know, I've always believed in the importance of a concept called design thinking. It's about open collaboration. And what you see with a property like this, you can create random serendipitous interactions. And so I try to figure out how these pieces fit together and people think I'm not paying attention and I'm doodling. And what I'm trying to do is sort of take all of the different points of view or ideas and see if there isn't enough coherence in them to reduce them to a single piece of paper. You can do that by writing words down or you can do it by trying to sort of create images or symbols that relate to one another and that convey in a less concrete way some of the ideas you're trying to grapple with. What I'm trying to do is stitch these threads together and, and construct out of the thread something that looks more like a whole, a tapestry. The drawing is just a point of departure for a more thorough and intelligent and complete conversation. For me, it's a way to take the complex and reduce it to the simple. crisis which is enveloping all of us and it was there before this pandemic hit as the pandemic frankly is part of it and it's still there waiting to be dealt with uh, but there's also been a long-term crisis in our ways of life in the uh, lack of fulfillment many people feel in the tensions the stresses the anxieties and all of this I think is related to our neglect of our relationship with the natural world with nature, with the other creatures we share this planet with, and with the ecosystems that we depend upon. Now look, there's a connection here in the way we've come to think about education. Let me put it this way. Most mass systems of education came into being you know, in the 18th century, and they're mostly based on the process of industrialism. Now there's an interesting parallel here, which is that the Industrial Revolution changed everything, of course, in the way that human beings conduct our lives. You know, we often talk about the need to save the planet. I mean, I don't know if you do, I, I often talk about it anyway. 
But uh, many people do. People say, you know, we, we have to solve the climate crisis and save the planet. You know, honestly, I feel fairly relaxed about this. I think the planet's going to be fine. Uh, we may not make it, but the planet will be great. The Earth has been around, so far as we can tell, for four and a half billion years. Human beings like us have been around for about 200,000 years. Now, I know that's a hard figure to visualise, but one way of thinking about it is this, that if you were to think of the whole history of the Earth as one year, a human beings showed up at less than a minute to midnight on the 31st of December. Now, the dinosaurs lasted, as far as we know, 30 million years. And we've managed in the space of just a few hundred to create circumstances which are now inimical very often to our own flourishing. So we've had great short-term success with these industrial systems, but they've also led to a catastrophic price. And we see that in the, the extent and the spread of the climate crisis currently. Now, the reason I'm saying all of this is that we have to make a settlement with the earth and we'll only make that settlement if we think differently about our relationship with it. And not only with plants, but also with the animals that we've come to depend upon. We've pretty much eradicated huge numbers of species in our dependence now on diets which are primarily based on four animals, you know, sheep and uh, cows and pigs and, and, and poultry. Now, these actually outnumber us by huge amounts. All of these things creep up on us naturally, don't they? they they're unnoticed. It's that boiling frog syndrome where we don't realise that these systems have overtaken us. But the consequence is that we have created systems which are unnatural and are short-term and not sustainable. Incidentally, the consequence as well is that we've created uh, sources of, of processed foods which are wreaking havoc on our own health. Now, you know a lot of this, but what I'm really saying is that we've replicated these same mistakes in our social systems and particularly in education. Our education systems are based on output, on yield. We put our children through these systems year after year, age group by age group, and the emphasis has been on output, on test data, on scores, on graduation rates, on everybody going to college and getting a degree. And this is as pointless and unsustainable in its own way as agricultural systems are based on industrial principles. Human beings are like the rest of life on Earth. We flourish under certain conditions and we wither in other, in other circumstances. The other parallel is this, that when I say that agricultural systems, the sustainable systems are based on cultivating the soil, this is also true of our communities, in our cities, in our neighbourhoods, in our schools, that people flourish when the culture is right. Great teachers great principles, great school systems understand that you don't make a successful education system based on driving people through pointless systems of tests and output and data-driven hurdles. That the way you get people to flourish is by recognising their individuality, the great diversity and depth of people's talents. For our, our children from every age are full of boundless possibilities. And you do that by creating a mixed culture in schools, one that values the sciences, the arts, technology, that, that values individual talent, the driving force of individual passions. In other words, successful schools don't focus on output, they focus on culture in the same way the sustainable farmers focus on the soil. If you get the culture right, everything else takes care of itself. And that really means a culture of compassion, of collaboration, of empathy, and of the valuing of individuals and the necessity of our social lives thriving through our joint participation. By the way, if we found out anything in this pandemic, it's how fundamentally we rely on these sorts of processes when the chips are down.